Organic farming is steadily increasing. That's good. Pour parler d'agriculture et d'Europe à la jeunesse. Der Klimawandel erfasst immer weitere Teile der Welt. Farmers help us bring nature back and preserve biodiversity. Ceux qui sont dans le rouge s'en sortent quand ils font plus vert. La qualité dans ce pays, elle doit être là pour tous. I've always been passionate about challenges in the food sector. I'm convinced that if we continue on the current path, we're heading for a dead end. So we need to adapt our ways of consumption and production. And for me, urban farming is part of the answer. Audrey Boucher manages an urban farm in Anderlecht, in the western part of Brussels. It's a pilot project aiming to tackle climate change and boost food security for an expanding population. But this is not a farm with an expanse of hectares. The food is growing upwards and indoors. This is what's known as vertical farming. But although the technology is established, vertical farming remains outside the mainstream. So, what are its advantages? What synergies does it offer with conventional agriculture? What about standards, labeling and regulation of this high-tech sector? Welcome to the latest episode of Food for Europe. First, welcome to Fabio Cossu, a policy analyst working in the Policy and Perspectives Unit in the European Commission's DG Agri. Tell us first, Fabio, what's the Commission's approach to vertical farming, given that it's very much a niche sector within agriculture? In the recent years, there has been a growing interest from EU policymakers around urban agriculture in general, and more specifically about controlled environmental agriculture, of which uh, vertical farming is a specific kind. I think the interest lies in the uh, level of technological innovation that this farming operation brings and the fact that they are seen as uh, really players of uh, Europe's food production landscape uh, because they promise to produce more with less. So I mean less uh, natural resources, less water, less soil, but also less uh, chemical input. And this they can really help to put the European food production system on a more sustainable path. There are still some doubts about the actual performance of such operations when it comes to uh, the environmental and socioeconomic impact. So all in all, I would say that from EU regulators, that's a bit of a mixed approach, uh, curiosity, cautiousness. To get a better understanding of the sector, we've spoken to some of those already working in controlled agriculture, starting with Building Integrated Green Houses, or BIGH, here in Brussels. I think you're familiar with them, right? Yes, I know it quite well. And I had to say Big Farm is one of a kind, but also one of many urban farming and vertical farming projects that are mushrooming, not only in Brussels, but also other European cities. And vertical farming projects can actually benefit from several funding programs. For example, under the current EU Research and Innovation Framework Program, which is called Horizon Europe, and also its predecessor, Horizon 2020. I think the EU has co-funded 20 projects around urban farming, contributing with a bit more of 180 million euros. OK, stay with us, but now let's get a sense of what people working in the sector have been telling us about it. To get to the BIGH farm, you first have to contend with weaving through crowds of people and negotiating the especially dense traffic in the district of Anderlecht. And then it's a question of crossing food met, a big indoor meat and fish market on the site of Anderlecht's historic abattoirs. Finally, it's up several flights of stairs to the roof of the building. And Audrey Boucher, the farm's manager, is there to welcome the Food for Europe team. Bonjour, bienvenue welcome to our farm, I'm going to show you around. Audrey is in her 30s. The boots she wears are not wellies you'd see on a farm, but a fashionable pair of heels. She's taking us to a garden space covering 2,000 square metres, next to a greenhouse on two levels with the same surface area. Seven people work here, mostly bioengineers, although Audrey herself came to urban farming from the world of finance. 
on va rentrer dans... OK, so here we're entering a corridor which leads us to the two types of cultivation we have on the first level, vegetables and rainbow trout. Et une production de truites saumonées. Yes, it's a very fishy smell. <laughs> It's not so bad. Here at Big Farm, we have an aquaponic system. It's a mix between aquaculture, so the cultivation of fish, and hydroponics. So the plants are not fixed in soil, but they take all the nutrients they need from the water. The fish that live in the water enrich it, so that it becomes a natural fertilizer for the plants. We're really in a circular economy. The electricity that is used here on the farm, it comes from solar panels on the Abatra site. There is a lot of thermal energy that is lost because there are many cold rooms and fridges here on the site. And so this energy, we recover it via heat pumps. On the roof of the greenhouses here, we recover the rainwater, which we mix with the fish water to provide the high highest quality water possible for optimal plant growth. There are tomatoes here. What do they taste like? Our tomatoes here are really excellent. We've had very positive feedbacks. We work closely with restaurants in Brussels and with organic supermarkets. So you can label this as organic? No. No, we can't do that for different reasons. First, our plants are not grown in soil, which means they can't be called organic. And secondly, for our fish to be labelled organic, that have to be in a natural environment, which clearly isn't the case on a rooftop in the heart of the city. And I can smell some basil, right? Yes, you're right, it's basil. Half of our production of aromatic herbs is basil. Here we're above the fish farm. Today the sky is dull, so we've added some artificial lights from LEDs. All of the water that the plants don't absorb is recovered, filtered and reused in our irrigation system. It's been going for five years, and already the Andelect urban farm produces annually 20 tonnes of trout, 300,000 pots of aromatic herbs, and five tonnes of tomatoes. It's still not enough to be profitable, according to Audrey. And so the next urban farm they're developing, on the outskirts of Lille in France, will have a production capacity of more than double. And while Audrey Boucher shows us around, amid the sound of children's laughter from the playground of a neighbouring school, I'm wondering how she sees herself, professionally, working in a vertical farm. I do consider myself a farmer. An urban farmer, yes, but I'm still a farmer. Farm Tech Society is a professional association for companies involved in the controlled agriculture sector. Its secretary-general, Thomas Zollner, worked alongside the Belgian architect Stephen Beckers to conceptualise BIGH. Thomas, welcome to Food for Europe. First of all, do we actually have a broadly agreed definition of what vertical farming is? What this vertical farming really means, it means probably going up instead of like staying horizontal uh, in its <laughs> more literal interpretation. But, uh, you know... In, in the whole trajectory of innovation, creating more with less, meaning less pollution, less land, uh, also less hazards and more predictability, more yields and the well-known uh, mature part of uh, this practice is uh, greenhouses. But out of that came also an approach which then eliminated the sun altogether, replaced it with artificial lighting, with climate control with irrigation, fertilizer. Your association has been in existence for only five years. Why did you create it? We try to represent all stakeholders, including agriculture, associations, suppliers, innovators, startups, and we have the academics. We want to be known to uh, really focus on standardization, on the data, and uh, also on the recognition of regulators. To date, uh, these types of systems are not regulated. They're part of uh, conventional agriculture. And this is a big disadvantage because the regulators do not really understand how to measure 
the outputs and inputs. How large is the segment? I mean, I don't know myself. I have a good idea, but we don't have data. And so the data requirements, also the agreements on standards, how to measure, how to compare, is a big uh, aim that our sector needs to uh, agree on for regulators to understand how can they actually design funding projects, because we do not have really a direct funding for this type of activity. So there's an absence of data, but give us your best guess about the space that vertical farming occupies in agriculture overall right now. The actual scale is still a niche. I would say it's even less than 1% of the overall production. What can you say about the people working in this sector, those creating and running such farms? Our vertical farmers uh, are generally uh, young. They come from non-agriculture background. They are also inclusive. There's uh, quite a large amount of women who are interested in this and actually practicing this. And how do you see vertical farming in the agriculture of the future? Agriculture is challenged by so many really dramatic problems and needs to really transform itself radically. The solutions could come from or partially out of controlled environment agriculture. We think that these types of new systems can actually help improve conventional farming by replacing certain processes in the production, like, for instance, uh, young plant production. Thomas Zilner. Thanks very much. Merci à vous. Well, vertical can mean going down as well as up. So what if vertical farming could be done underground, for example? This is what Urban Crop Solutions offers. We went to meet Martin van der Kroes, one of the founders of the company based in Waregem, a town in Flanders surrounded by apple orchards. On the walls of his office is a black and white photo from the early years of the 20th century, showing farm workers and machinery from the era. Well, this actually describes the main economic activity of the region here in southwest Flanders, which was flax production until the 1960s. And what is great about this picture is because it also describes the two main activities we do in our company, being agricultural research and machine building. And we combine this together in the shape of indoor vertical farming. Martin has come to controlled agriculture from a career in marketing. Now he knows all there is to know about growing plants with artificial light. Blue and red are the most important lights for a plant for their photosynthetic um, activity. But we also need some far red light for the plant to do some stretching. We need some green light to make sure it can penetrate the leaves. And here we also add some white chips because visually then you can see representative colors. We climb a staircase to get an overview of the research laboratories. Ten or so glass compartments that enable the company to study plant biology in different climatic conditions. Because we're in a closed environment, we're minimizing external influences, we have no winter. You don't have any, well, any diseases, any pests, so we don't need pesticides, fungicides. And because we grow the plants in this closed box, actually, all the humid that they transpire, we recapture and reuse. So we really maximize the water use efficiency as well. Manufactured in the company's Belgian workshops, each module designed by Urban Crop Solutions fits inside a shipping container. It's a kind of four-level merry-go-round for plants, which move along at controlled speeds under LED lights. Around 60 of them are already in operation in Tahiti, the Middle East, Europe and North America, and not necessarily in urban areas. The location of vertical farms from a geographical point of view is, is not per se the most important thing we're trying to achieve in contrast to globalization, decentralization, and really producing as close to the point of consumption as possible. It doesn't need to be top tier real estate space. This can be in warehouse locations, this can be in abandoned buildings and basements. The beauty of these closed environments is that you can place them everywhere. And for Martin, everywhere really does mean just that. One of the um, largest research collaborations we've done is the Space Bakery project. How can people survive on other planets? And we actually looked at wheat, so minimizing power use, minimizing water use, but also minimizing substrate use. So we grew these plants using lava stones, which are just present on Mars as they are on planet Earth, as they actually are also on the Moon. 
And to our great surprise, we outcompeted the yield that we can achieve um, by a factor of six compared to outdoor growing. Three, two, one, zero, and liftoff. But until we see the first colonists on Mars, let's keep our feet firmly on the ground. How does Martin see the agriculture of tomorrow in the context of population pressures and climate change? I think agriculture of the future will have a stronger focus on efficiency and on quality. Now with vertical farming, we have the opportunity to go back to these original crops which had way higher nutritional values. And how do I see this? Like we have open field agriculture, we have greenhouse agriculture, indoor farming will just be another segment next to those two and they will all coexist and create added value for each other. Fabio Kosu from DG Agri. Do you buy into this futuristic farming vision? Uh, yes, I very much do. I'm convinced that uh, control environment agriculture can really play an important role in, in feeding the world, especially when it comes to city dwellers. I think we expect that by 2050, close to 70% of the world population will live in large uh, urban areas. Now, we asked Audrey Boucher from BIGH about EU assistance for the sector. She made the following observation. The subsidies currently granted to agriculture are not necessarily adapted to urban agriculture since they are often based on surface areas. The aim of urban agriculture is to produce as much as possible on the smallest possible surface area, and so it runs contrary to the principle of the subsidy regime. It's a shame because it's still possible to produce in quantity in cities. Audrey's talking there, obviously, about the common agricultural policy. What's your response? When we talk about this basic public funding, we also need to ask ourselves why we're doing it. And one of the main why of the common agricultural policy is to support for lower than average income of European farmers and help to make their operation more environmentally friendly along the way. Vertical farmers are quite different uh, in nature. They demonstrate to be self-sustaining business operations in the market. So some funding is available also for their setup and further development. This said, I don't think it's only a question of funding, but also removing uh, other regulatory barriers, eh? like urban zoning, building permits, and another important factor would be to ensure that we have people that are rightly skilled uh, in order to run these businesses. To end with, I'd like to go back to the issue Audrey raised about not being able to label her produce organic because it's not grown in soil. Why won't the EU introduce an organic label for the produce she's cultivating? One of the fundamental principles of organic farming, which is also a shrine in the legislation, is the connection, the link to the living soil. And this is not likely, likely to change. We don't see the opportunity to create a separate label in that respect. However, this said, um, you probably know the farm to fork strategy. Uh, so under this strategy, the Commission is working on a proposal for sustainability labeling. The aim is to help, on the one hand, the consumers to make more sustainable food choices, uh, but also, on the other hand, to create incentives for food businesses to improve their sustainability. So in principle, this would cover all types of agricultural production, so including food producing control environmental agriculture. Organic, as we said, indoor farming, other type of farming have each their own merits. This diversity will only help to increase the resilience of our food system and help us to face the challenges of the biodiversity and climate crisis. Fabio Kosu, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, the next time you do your shopping, maybe the mushrooms, the salad or the basil that you put in your basket could come from a vertical farm not so very far away from your home. And if that's not the case now, it may well be sooner than later. That's it for this edition of Food for Europe. Thanks to all our guests for their contribution to this podcast. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with another episode looking at the best of European food and farming. Curious? We look forward to your company again. Organic farming is steadily increasing. That's good. Pour parler d'agriculture et d'Europe à la jeunesse, 
Der Klimawandel erfasst immer weitere Teile der Welt. Farmers help us bring nature back and preserve biodiversity. Ceux qui sont dans le rouge s'en sortent quand ils font plus vert. La qualité dans ce pays, elle doit être là pour tous. 